Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. Well, we were going to, and we promoted heavily this morning, that we were going to speak with Hornell Police Chief Ted Murray. Uh, the police chief uh, called about... Uh, 740 and said he was unable to make it today so uh, we uh, were lucky enough to get Assemblyman Phil Palmasano who coincidentally was in the state legislature halls this morning till what about 740 this morning Assemblyman? Yeah still at the Capitol but we were in session till about 745 this morning finishing up the budget. Now um, the little of it that I haven't had in the news and I'm reading from my newscast here They've worked out a deal on the budget. I'm getting for this from the Time Union. The governor got his 2% property tax cap made permanent, an extra billion dollars for education, and the governor will be closing three prisons, not just two. Let's start out with the uh, state's uh, 2% tax cap, Assemblyman. Yes, I mean, that was something, I mean, our conference was supportive of. It was part of the, the final adopted budget. Um, but what we've said all along, the tax cap is a good thing. It's helped control the growth in property taxes. But really the goal should be to reduce the property tax burden that's placed on our citizens, our senior citizens, our local governments, or our families. And the only way we're going to get at reducing that uh, property tax burden is that going after the mandates that continue to drive up local budgets and local, therefore local property taxes. But there's not much in the line of trying to reduce the, uh, the, the mandates that are out there. Instead, uh, there's a lot of shifts in this budget, from my perspective, that would make that be, make the local governments have to spend more money. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples right now. Uh, first of all, they, put some, they did put some money in there for the early voting, but there's some questions about whether that's even going to begin to cover the cost of that. Uh, the other big area I would say is, you know, we are very familiar with how the governor proposed the $59 million in AIM cuts. That's money that goes, uh, unrestricted aid, that money goes to towns and villages and cities. Uh, the governor had proposed to cut those, that aid for any municipalities that, that AIM funding was less than 2% of the their total budget expenditure, I believe. Well, that affected numerous towns around the southern tier and in the Finger Lakes area, hundreds of, and thousands, I think it was nearly a thousand municipalities were going to lose total aid. So what the governor did, you know, the one house budgets we passed both restored the full funding to the AIM funding for those municipalities, the way it used to be direct support aid by the state. The governor had proposed to, well, take the money from the counties. Well, ultimately, what happened is the legislative role rolled and caved to the governor, and basically they agreed with the governor. So now uh, those towns and villages are going to get that $59 million that the governor proposed cut. But that money is going to come from the sales tax money uh, that goes to our county. So what that turns into for our property taxpayers is an unfunded mandate, and that's just wrong because we should have paid for that uh, direct support state aid. So some of the some of the villages and towns are funded through through sales tax from the t- from the counties. The other ones are continued to be funding funded through their regular format and formula. Like the city of Hornell is funded through their regular formula. They receive no cut. But so this is just another cost shift, another unfunded mandate. It's a big one, fifty nine million dollars. That's the problem. And I think when you talk about this area, when we talk about local governments. I'd be remiss not to get into uh, another funding cut that was agreed to by the legislature that the, with the governor. Um, first of all, there was no CHIPS funding increase. That's money, direct money that goes to local municipalities, towns, villages, and cities and counties so they can help improve their local infrastructure on their local roads, bridges, and culverts. For the seven-plus years it's been flat funding, this budget contained no increase in funding, Yet, at the same time, they, this budget passed funding and, and a funding stream to create for billions of dollars for the MTA. Now, listen, I'm a strong supporter of the MTA. I understand they have a crisis. We need to be partners and help support the MTA. Um, our, our, there are a lot of companies that are benefited from MTA spending, Alstom and Hornell, um, Bombardier and Canona. Uh, CAF and Elmira, I'm supportive of funding for the MTA, but we also need to have some parity in our transportation funding program. So at the same time, they're increasing funding for billions of dollars for the MTA, no increase in CHIPS funding for local municipalities. They had the audacity, quite frankly, to cut 
and I, let me repeat this, cut $65 million in the Extreme Winter Recovery Program. That's money that goes to our towns, villages, cities, counties, so they can fix their local infrastructure, roads, bridges, and culverts. But this is for, for extreme weather. We've had a rough weather winter, and I don't understand the rationale and why would we cut that funding to those local municipalities. That's a direct shift and um, a problem for our property tax payers. That was a 10% cut in infrastructure money to our towns and villages and cities and counties. It makes no sense, and I don't understand it, and it's very, very frustrating. Now, um... When you said earlier in the interview that the legislature caved to what the governor wanted on some issues, are we talking, st- is it still the three men in a room kind of thing with uh, the governor and Assembly Leader Carl Heasty and State Senate Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins? I guess my question is, was uh, Brian Kolb, the Assembly Republican Leader, and State Senator John Flanagan, the Senate Republican Leader, were they involved at all? Absolutely not, and it's really kind of disappointing because the new majority leader in the Senate, uh, Crystal People Stokes, always at or no, I'm sorry, that's she's the majority leader in the Assembly. I apologize, Andrea Stewart Cousins, the new Senate majority leader, what, who was the minority in the past, always complained and said that the minority should be involved in the budget discussions. But yet now that she's in the majority, I don't see her calling for fairness and having the minorities there because she's in the majority. And you know, that's her right to do that, but it's kind of hypocritical to call for it when you're in the minority, and now you're in the majority to kind of thumb your nose and say, no, we don't need the minority, the more minority parties there. And quite frankly, that's what we're getting. And I have to constantly remind people, listen, ladies and gentlemen, elections have consequences. Um, you know, we elected Governor Cuomo, re-elected Governor Cuomo. They elected a state senate that's Democratic control, which this budget has totally uh, shifted its priorities to a very progressive, liberal type philosophic philosophy. And we've already seen that start from January first. It started with that drastic expansion of abortion, uh, which would allow an abortion to take place up until the moment of birth to allow for more late-term abortions. And I know people try to defend this government and say, well, it's just a codification of Roe v. Wade. I will again remind the listeners, this is not a codification of Roe v. Wade. This is an outright expansion of abortion. With the gun control legislation to hinder the rights of law-abiding citizens for the Second Amendment, it's, you know, the, the election reform for mandatory um, uh, early voting and, and things of that nature. But that's a funding cut. Funding costs associated. That's an unfunded mandate. They put some money in it, but it's not going to cover the total cost. These are the types of policies we've seen. This budget has is it contains the Dream Act, so it will provide free college under the the free college tuition program, free college college tuition for illegal immigrants, tap assistance for illegal immigrants, at a time when citizens and their families and people who are here legally are struggling under a crippling uh, commer- uh, student loan debt burden that are having hard times to afford college. We're providing um, free college to individuals who are here illegally. Uh, and, and that's just, I think, a, a mispriority. I think people are, are would really kind of have some problems with that. Now, Assemblyman, if I could stop you there. Talking to Assemblyman Phil Palmasato, do we know anything about uh, SUNY tuition for uh, the native New Yorkers who live here? Well, I think the SUNY tuition is going to continue to go up under a rational plan, but uh, there's no uh, really I, that I recall seeing anything, any type of tap increase for for our, our individuals who have been here for a long time. But that's the kind of the shift that we've seen in this budget, and it's very, very concerning, quite frankly. There are so many things I can point to. The failed promise to, to provide salary, the, the, uh, the, the salary increase that was promised, they increased the salary for our direct support professionals, those individuals who work with our most vulnerable citizens, the developmentally disabled. They shortchanged them. They're giving them a two percent. It wasn't. Pro- it was a promised three and a half percent, and it's supposed to be six and a half percent over two years. Well, do you have a sense of what they're making now? Uh, they're not making very much. In fact, some if someone can go work at McDonald's on the minimum wage increase that's going through that direct order that was done, done not by legislative action, not by a vote, by an unelected commissioner in a, in a board that basically said um, you go up, you know, the minimum wage goes up to fifteen dollars. Even in upstate New York, above the twelve fifty uh, minimum wage uh, set in that's going for other businesses, but the minimum wage for uh, fast food industry is going up 
or even above and beyond that. It's not keeping pace with the minimum wage for McDonald's. And these individuals are direct support to support, to support professionals who care for our most vulnerable citizens, the developmentally disabled. Why are not we providing them with a living wage? That makes only sense. We need to be making sure that we're providing that assistance to them. And it's unfortunate that the governor, you know, he had to send his, his uh, budget, one of his, uh, bu- uh, his assistants to a rally last week or two weeks ago when the Be Fair to Direct Care workers were having a rally. And the governor got out, his person got up and said, the governor is not going to sign a budget without the raise for the direct support professionals. Well, yes, there's a budget for a raise for direct support professionals, but it's not the raise that they were promised years ago under the agreement that took place. That's what this governor does. He'll come in there and try to take credit for everything, but he, it's a failure. It's a failure of the promise that was made, and that's unfortunate. Assemblyman, can I stop you there with uh, what Liz Benjamin is saying this morning? Sure. And you've been out of the legislative chambers for one hour. Uh, Her headline, an April Fool's Day budget. One might argue that the joke is on New Yorkers this year, Liz Benjamin writes. And she talks about sleepy-eyed reporters read through the announcement and dutifully woke up to see the bare-bone details, though some were headed to the state capitol. It became quickly clear that the number of last-minute details had yet to be finalized. She talks about uh, the rank and file lawmakers walked around and got the details hashed out behind closed doors. And she said this happened, uh, she was talking about this on a Sunday when almost no one except various special interest advocates, lobbyists, and members of the media were paying one iota of attention. So now you're coming at it from the conservative side. She's coming at it from the liberal side. Sounds like Nobody's too pleased there this morning, Assemblyman. I'm certainly not pleased at all. Let me give you another example of what happened with this budget. We talked about the up to three prison closures. The first bill we had said up to two prison closures. Now, listen, and that would allow uh, with 90-day notification. Under the current law, the governor can close any correctional facility, but he would have to give one-year notification so to, to the legislature, to those facilities. So, you know, obviously, when there's a prison closure in a community, that has a ripple effect through that community. It's disruptive to a family. Now they're trying to say, with these closures, no one will lose their job through attrition and being able to transfer to another facility. So think about it. Instead of having a whole year to do that, now these individuals only have 90 days. Now, through that negotiation, it seemed like, well, we, if we agree to two, then the third prison wouldn't be closed. Well, before the ink was even dried on that bill, they had went and cut another deal for the other third prison for 90 days. And it's just as unreal, it's unrealistic, it's ridiculous, and quite frankly, it's insulting. Let me tell you why. This governor has gone around the state for the past few years talking and bragging and, and taking ownership in the number of uh, correctional facilities he has closed under his watch. But what this governor has failed to do is take ownership for the powder keg environment in our correctional facilities, these closures and its policies have created in our correctional facilities. And it's only, all you have to do, Brian, is look at his own numbers by the Department of Correctional Services. In the past five years, from 2013 to 2018, assaults has increased over 50%. Inmate on staff assaults increased up over 50%. Inmate on inmate assaults are up over 50%. It's a dangerous environment. They're reclassifying dangerous uh, prisoners into medium security prisons and when they should be in maximum. And what I've said over and over again, before we even start to even have a conversation about closing any correctional facility, the first thing we should do is eliminate and stop the dangerous practice of double bunking and double selling inmates. And that's the first thing we should do. We have over 6,500, almost 7,000 double bunks and double cells in our facilities. Let's get rid of that practice. Let's get rid of those double bunks and double cells. If we do that, that would stop on the overcrowding of our facilities. But it's not. It's not happening. And what this has done is created this powder keg environment because these assaults continue to go up in our facilities. It's a dangerous place for our corrections officers to work. You know, these brave men and women leave home and go to work each day not knowing what exactly is going to happen or what can exactly to expect. Someone's going to try to attack them and beat them, and someone's going to try to spit on them, throw feces on them. That's what happens in these facilities. It's very dangerous, and we should be telling these corrections officers, hey, listen, 
we have our back, and our policy should reflect that. Unfortunately, the policies that we, I saw in this budget with these prison closures doesn't say we have their back. It's like putting a knife in their back. It's sad, it's unfortunate, it's disappointing, and it's just plain wrong. We're going to take a quick break, Assemblyman, and be back in just a moment. Stay with us. If you own your own business and need garbage removal, contact Lippincott's. And if you live in a town where you have to take care of your own garbage removal, contact Lippincott's. If you need garbage dumpsters, Lippincott's rents them, and Lippincott's can come pick up the garbage too. These days, you don't throw old electronic items in the trash, and Lippincott's can remove your old electronics. Lippincott's, for garbage removal, recycling, hauling, removal of asbestos, or electronic items. For a free quote, visit LippincottsRubbishInc.com. LippincottsRubbishInc.com. Tom. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carolyn, who is a New York City native and is not terribly pleased about the budget news this morning. Rob, tell us why. Well, I just, it, I don't know how much longer they can keep doing this. I mean, you, now you're going to have to pay $11 to drive south of 60th Street in Manhattan, $25 for a truck. That's going to be passed along to the consumers. Who, who did this? Is this a Cuomo thing, de Blasio thing? It's, it, it's a both of them together. Um, then the fact that they're going to now, you know, I can understand outlawing plastic bags, but the state's now going to charge five cents a paper bag. You think New York City's going to get a little smaller? Well, I just don't know how people stay there. I, 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 I see my daughter and what she's got to make to try and live in Queens. Uh, I mean, she's making, you know, what I would have considered 20 years ago a really, really good salary. Anywhere else in the country, she'd be living large. But because she's in the city, she's, you know, struggling to make ends meet. It's really ridiculous. Hey, what do you got for us weather-wise, Rob? Well, some much cooler temperatures, Brian. We had some milder weather this weekend, and the cold front came through, dumped a little bit of snow, brought in a little bit of cloudiness. That's in the process of moving out as high pressure heads our way from the Ohio River Valley. Uh, that's going to lead to it turning partly to mostly sunny today. We're up to about 35 to 40. Uh, right now, we're looking at a sunrise this morning. That was at 651. Sunset later this evening at 736. Tonight, we're clear. We're cold. We're down at 20 to 25, so make sure you haven't put that winter jacket away just yet. Tomorrow, partly sunny, turning milder, 45 to 50. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy, not as cold, 30. And Wednesday looks really nice. Lots of sunshine, 50 to 55. Before you know it, Brian, they're going to be taxing sunshine as well. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. You got it, sir. <laughs> Back with Assemblyman uh, Phil Palmasano. Assemblyman, uh, again, the, it doesn't seem like there's anybody too happy with this budget uh, from what I've seen so far anyway. Uh, Liz Benjamin calling the governor out on numerous items. Uh, Nick Reisman a little bit less so, talking about the Spectrum News reporters online. Assemblyman, they are, uh, both the left and the right, uh, are calling the governor out on a middle-of-the-night pay raise. What do we know about that? Well, the, uh, you know, obviously there was a there was provision through a commission last year that implemented a pay raise for uh, the legislature uh, through this commission. They made recommendations for the governor and the lieutenant governor. The only way the governor and the lieutenant governor could get a pay raise is if the legislature passes a resolution uh, giving them that, giving him and her that raise. And obviously, they pushed for this to be done as part of the budget as well. He keeps saying that he didn't want it, but they they pushed for it. Um, and I quite ironically, that I find interesting is um, the pay raise for the governor and lieutenant governor didn't do, say anything about banning outside income, which was part of the legislature's uh, proposal on their pay increase. And basically by doing that, they, in essence, made the legislature a full-time legislature and not, not a part-time legislature, which it was intended to be. To make the legislature full-time should actually take a constitutional amendment and how they got away with increasing, making it a, a full-time legislature, because when you take away outside income, basically... You're either working or not, and, and that's problematic. I know there's been lawsuits filed on that regard, a um, couple different lawsuits filed on that, uh, whether because the commission overstepped, whether the commission overstepped their boundaries in basically banning outside income and on some other things. But the fact of the matter is the governor was obviously pushing, will give myself and my the lieutenant governor a big pay increase. So... And he wasn't going to do certain things with the budget without that, so the legislature did that. But it's just ironic that they would give him the increase without dealing with the outside income, preventing him from making outside income, whether it's book sales, although I don't know who would really want to buy one of his books, but whatever it may be, um, why should we not have the same uh, uh, restrictions on him and his ability to earn outside income versus 
uh, the legislature. Uh, and then, How were you uh, on the, uh, as far as your vote went on the governor's pay rate? I voted no. Listen, my, my, my thinking is I've heard the governor for the past several years saying he's looking out for upstate. No, he's not. Not with his, the actions I've seen from him over the past several months with the policies that have come in place. I'll go back again to that drastic abortion expansion uh, that basically would allow for abortion up, at time to, up until the moment of birth. I don't think that was in the right interest of upstate New York or, or people in the state altogether. I'll go to his continued attack on the Second Amendment and trying to put more restrictions on the rights of law-abiding citizens. That's not looking out for upstate New York. Uh, again, I'll look at his budget. I'll go back to his budget. He, he was focused on the MTA and downstate for making sure we got the funding there, but yet he goes and cuts in his budget proposal $65 million for local infrastructure, roads and bridges, does not provide another in, an increase for CHIPS funding at all. At the same time, uh, he's providing billions for the MTA and pushing for billions for the MTA. Uh, he goes and changes, cuts $59 million from local towns and villages, saying they don't need it. If it's not 2% of their budget, he cuts it. And then now, okay, I'll restore it, but I'm going to not restore it with state aid, state money, like it's been done in the past, like it's a common practice. Instead, we're going to put a new Internet sales tax on, and we're going to take that money and make it come from the county. So it's another unfunded mandate on the local municipalities, therefore the property taxpayers. He's cutting $20 million from the library construction grant program. That's the libraries are very vital. That's a very successful program for our libraries. And let's let's say let's not forget he's increasing his school taxes for individuals because he's capping the growth to zero, not allowing the star savings to grow anymore. That's an increase in property taxes. That's not looking out for upstate. So yeah, that's why I voted no. How about that for an example? <laughs> Assemblyman Phil Palmisano, uh, pretty heated this morning, Assemblyman, uh, and uh, understandably why. Like we said, uh, both sides not too pleased this morning with Governor Andrew Cuomo. Assemblyman Phil Palmisano, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian.